chapter 30, verse 5. We're going to spend a lot of time at the end of the service in the book of Acts. So I'm just giving you a heads up in Acts chapter 26. But first we're going to start in the book of Psalm chapter 30, verse 5. Mm-hmm. I got to slow down a little bit. I'm already fired up. I got to ease into this just a little. Or I'll run out of steam. Last week I about lost my voice. So It's tough when you do that here before you get out there. God's been good to us. We're, we're practicing, preparing for the Muscle Car Sunday. Amen. Looking forward to that. There's sign-up sheets in the back for those of you that like to be a little more involved. Amen. It's going to take a large group to pull off what we want to do, but thank God for that. And each time I go to a car show, people ask me, hey, y'all doing the car show this year? Yeah, we want to do it. This morning, I want to talk to you about a very simple thought. It's not a witty thought. It's a very real thought. And that is for us to decide to overcome 2020. You know, our, our theme for Muscle Car Sunday is overcoming 2020. The issue in life is to decide to overcome. Because many of us, we're not careful. We just kind of mentally and spiritually shut down till next year, hoping that somehow when the clock kicks over to 2021, everything's going to change. Either that time or either November the 4th, we think somehow everything's going to change. But the bottom line is you have to decide today, I'm going to get the best out of this year and what remains in this year. Can you get an amen? Because we have never seen a year like this. A pandemic with COVID-19. I'm calling it COVID-20 right now. Amen. It done jumped over into this year. Six feet apart. Mass. No, no mass. Vaccine. No vaccine. Test. Negative. Positive. Negative. It's according to how many you take it and whether or not you get negative, positive, negative. Because it works that way now. The upheaval of sports, hurricanes, fires. I spoke with uh, several out in California yesterday. Uh, it's amazing. The fires in Oregon and California right now that's covering that place. As a matter of fact, it stops right before it gets into Canada. I don't know if God has anything to do with that boundary line, but I'll leave it like that. Racial tensions, riots, justifying looting, murder, political divides, e economy suffering, churches are closing. One in five churches in the next 18 months will close in America. Already 25,000 churches have closed over the summer. You know, business is suffering, schools closed, then they open, then they stay home. This is a year you have to decide. You have to be determined to overcome. Again, we have to have something to come over before we can be an overcomer, and I believe it's this year. Are you comfortable? Yeah, don't, don't, don't do that. You've got to exercise. You've got to work it out. Amen. For some of you, this is the only exercise you get. Amen. If you want more exercise, go to a Catholic church. They get you up and down a whole lot for those that are open. Psalm chapter 30, verse 5. For his anger endures but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. The scripture tells us that our walk with God is going to be a journey of ups and downs. It's going to be a place of valleys and mountains. We are continually moving from strength to strength, from victory to victory, to glory to glory. However, in between the mountaintops of victory, there are valleys of the shadow of death. So in between the victories, there are struggles. In between the breakthroughs, there are battles. In between the joy comes the weeping. Let me say this to you. You don't deserve the joy until you've had some weeping. Amen. You don't enjoy the joy. Until you've had some weeping. Amen. When you've wept all night, when you've wept through a season, when you've suffered a little while in life, then when the joy comes, it just makes it all the better. Now, I've never had a child, but I've given birth to a couple of churches. <laughs> Amen. And I can tell you this. It's good to see you, Riley. Amen. Uh, but whenever you, well, uh, they tell me, ladies, that, that all that pain that you endure, all the struggles after nine months, and, all, and when that baby gets here, and you hold that baby for the first time, the joy that overwhelms you, amen, you forget about the pain. Again, I say to you, you're not, you know, no matter the joys that come in 21, going to have a lot to do with what you endured in 2020. Amen. So it's very important. In every level, there's another devil. So you get done with this one, know this, there's something else coming. And then right at the right point of the breakthrough, there's a battle to be fought. And it's the job of the enemy. Yes, we have an enemy of our souls that will try to get us to turn back when the struggle heats up. It's the job of the enemy to get us to surrender during the weeping of the night so we'll experience the joy of the morning. It's the job of the enemy to get us to surrender during the battle so that we'll never experience overcoming. But I'm telling you, and I believe this in my whole heart, it may look like things are breaking up, but actually we're going to have a breakthrough. 
Amen. I refuse to go through stuff like this and not have something better on the other side. For our churches, for our families, for our businesses, whatever it is that we may be involved in. It may look like we're going to die in the struggle, but we're getting ready to step over some, some walls that have been uh, brought down because we chose to overcome. And I saw in your testimonies over and over so many people in this house that have overcome. Father, I thank you for the word. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to stand before great people. I speak in their lives. Lord, we will decide to overcome this year. We're going to see great things happen yet. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God a big shout. I don't know if you guys realize this, but you helped set me up for the next service. I tell the band that you set me up for the preaching and you set me up for the next service. So the more you amen me and agitate me on, the better they're going to get it out there. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. And they'll thank you when I get there too. Hallelujah. The scripture says in Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I believe that we're in a season. That it's in a season of hardship. There's some tough things going on. But if we don't faint, if we don't give up, in other words, there's something just right ahead if we stay with it. Not to faint, not to give up, don't give in, don't retreat, don't dig in, don't turn right, don't turn left, don't you turn. Keep fighting. It's just the battle before the breakthrough. It's our Gethsemane. Jesus went through the garden, amen, of pressure before he got to the cross and the cross before he got to the joy of heaven. Amen. There's something you got to go through. Uh, Jacob, before his name was changed to Israel, he fought with an angel in a place called Paniah. The scripture says the angel touched his hip, his hip socket. He limped like I did through the rest of his life, but it was a blessing in his life. And when you study it totally out, it wasn't just any angel. It was God himself that fought him and changed his ways. His name literally meant worm. That's who he was. He was a, a conniver. Jacob, everything about him spoke that way. But after he fought with God, things turned around in his life. Amen. Strength is not born by seeing miracles. Strength is not born by seeing miracles. Many of us have seen miracles, but it didn't change us. My friend, strength is born through struggle. When you have struggle in life, that's where strength comes. And we're being made ready to inhabit a promise that God has for us. I, I've said this before, that our greatest battle comes right before our greatest breakthrough. I, I, there's something about, as a young boy raised up in North Alabama, you did not get to see this the way you do here in Houston, being close to Ellington Air Force Base. If you were in North Alabama and you saw a jet move across the sky, you stopped. Sam, you looked at it. And you'd see that white stream flow in behind it. And if you ever saw two of them crisscross, oh, it was like, come on, what a day in the blue sky to see that. When you study about Chuck Yeager, he was the first man to ever break the sound barrier in an aircraft. Planes like the British Meteor Jets that approach the speed of sound, 760 miles per hour, amen, at sea level, 660 miles per hour at 40,000 feet, had encountered severe buffeting and, and rattling of the controls. At that time, no one knew for sure whether a plane could exceed Mach 1, the speed of sound. The U.S. Army was determined to find out. The Army had developed a small bullet-shaped aircraft, the Bell X-1, to challenge the sound barrier. A, a civilian pilot, his name was Slick. I'm sorry, Stick. Let me put these on. No, it's Slick. That L is an L, not a T. Sometimes you got to get your glasses on, amen. Oh, Slick Goodwin, good, I, what a name. Slick Goodwin, amen, had taken the Bell X-1 to .7 Mach when Jaeger started to fly it, he pushed the small plane up to point eight, and then to point eight five, and then to point nine. Mark, but backed off when the plane began to shake uncontrollably. The date of October the 14th, 1947, was set up for the attempt to do Mach 1. As he approached Mach 1, that plane began to shake and rattle and be buffeted from side to side, so much so that he was not sure that he could, would explode in midair. But on this day, Chuck said, I refuse to turn back now. If I die, I die trying, but I am not going to back down. I've been chose before and close before. But no matter what happens today, I'm going for it. And that, he shoved the controls forward and headed for the sonic wall. In the accounts of this momentous event recorded in the book, The Right Stuff, the author records the X-1 went through the sonic wall without so much as a bump. As the speed topped out at Mach point one. 
11.05, Jaeger had the sensation of shooting straight through the top of the sky. The sky turned a deep purple, and all at once the stars and the moon came out. The sun shone at the same time. He was simply looking out into space. He was master of the sky. Unique and involatile. Amen. Above the dome of the world, Chuck Yeager achieved a level no one had ever reached simply because he refused to turn around and go back. There are times in life that people are watching you. They're observing your life. They're wondering if you're going to push through the turbulence. If you're going to push through all the shaking going on in your life. And I'm telling you there's got to be something on the other side. And I'm telling you someday it may seem like you're going to shake, rattle, and roll and be tossed to and fro. Don't turn around now. You're on the verge of a very new experience. I've got to believe that 2020, even with all the stuff going on, is setting us up for a great year ahead. Amen. I refuse. you got to refuse at times to sit back and say, I'm, going, you, you, I'm not going to lose this time. I'm going to press through it. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8, we're troubled on every side. Not, yet not distressed, we are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. And we may be shaken, but we're not going to be destroyed. We're entering into a realm of anointing. When you go through stuff like this, when I say anointing, I'm talking about an unction from God to where you pray and things happen quicker. When you pray and you have a stronger faith that something's going to uh, give loose and, and break through because you've been through the breakthrough before. The battle is always the hardest right before the breakthrough. You know, I've heard it say so much lately, Pastor, I'm telling you, I've prayed. I've got emails, text messages. People prayed, and instead of getting things easier, things looked like they were harder. What I say, I'm saying it this morning. I have claimed my husband, my wife, my sister, my brother, my friend for Jesus. It seemed like they're getting meaner. It seemed like they're nastier than they ever been before. Amen. What I tell you, the shaking's going on. There's going to be a breakthrough. Pastor, I've prayed for greater anointing. It seems that I'm less anointed now than I've ever been. I have taken the liberty of grabbing some testimonies from some of the people that have sh- We've had uh, 30, 40 testimonies out of this church have been shared online. Just grabbed a couple of them, and, and I'll be careful with them. But one of them says, you know, Pastor challenged us. Uh, and, and this young lady in this church says, delivery is urgent, immature fetus, girl transferred to the hospital for artificial lung ventilation, brain hypoxia. My parents were told that I'd never be able to breathe on my own. My brain wasn't receiving oxygen. I'll never be able to survive on my own. My legs were crooked. I'll never be able to walk. And that I was going to die any second because I was born too prematurely. Whew. Well, look what God did. Amen. He, he proved both of these hospitals and doctors wrong. I can breathe. I can smile. I can walk even in high heels. Hallelujah. God is so good. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. Share your testimony what God is doing in your life. Ain't no testimony too small. Amen. Hitting the rock and keep right on moving. Right, Natalia? Amen. Keep moving. Another one said to me in 1988, I checked myself into a rehab lockup. While I was there, they required us to write the first four steps of, of AA. I was attempting that, that unsuccessfully. I waited until my roommate was asleep. I got on my knees and I prayed. I asked God to help me amen, with my drinking problem, and he did. I gave my heart to Jesus. When I got out, I stayed active in church and sober until I retired. Shortly after retirement, oh, don't amen me yet. This one, amen's at the end. Shortly after retirement, I started my own business. Slowly, I got too busy for God. I started drinking again. After a few years, my wife told me I was going to, if I was going to keep drinking, she wouldn't stay with me. I left. God didn't give up on me, and neither did my wife. Three months later, I was whining to myself about being old and having nothing or no one. God told me, no one took it away from you. You left it all. Next morning, I was in church with God. God restored me in my marriage. He is faithful. He is good. Thank you, Jesus, for not giving up on me. Amen. Amen. Revelation 12, 11 states. And again, these are, these are people that decided to overcome. I'm not just going to hit, I'm not going to just hit the wall and back off. And they overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. This young lady said to me, Pastor, I started using drugs at age 9. By the time I was 16, I was a junkie. My life was nothing but hell. These folk go to this church. Amen. I walked away from family, chose to live on the streets, and I did anything to support myself. I was raped, beat up, shot, left for dead, finally put in jail for a drug charge to rehab where I finally surrendered to God. That was 27 years ago. God has given me back my two daughters, a husband, a home, my own business. It's not easy being a believer, but life still has its ups and downs. But at least I know where my eternity is. That's heaven. Thank God for not giving up on me. Can we give God a praise in this house? 
These were three testimonies I yanked out of about 25. Sometimes you've got to realize, my friend, you've got to decide to overcome. You're not just going to hit the wall and back away. This time, I'm going to press through it. The darkest night is just before the dawn. I'm telling you, the battle rages the hottest just before the victory. Just stay with it. Don't turn back. You're getting ready to inherit the land that God has for you. If your enemy is fighting you harder than ever, it is because he knows you're closer than ever to this victory. Amen. Every level... Another devil. So prepare yourself. Don't give up in the battle. You know, Cortez was a guy who landed up on our shores, a Spanish conquistador. When he got there, his men revolted. They wanted to turn back towards Spain. You know what he did? He burned his ships. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes you got to burn your ships. Hallelujah. You're not going to break up. You're going to break through. You're going to overcome 2020. Don't give up too soon. Right on the verge of a miracle. Don't go down in history as an almost. I said, don't go down in history. As an almost. Paul was witnessing. Paul the apostle. The great preacher. He was witnessing to King Agrippa. The second governor of Chalice. Paul's testimony to him. As he stood before this great man. Whose father incidentally had slain James. So he's standing before the guy. Whose daddy had James beheaded. One of the uh, disciples. Also had imprisoned Peter. His words rang with such authority and power. That King Agrippa. And I imagine white knuckling, gripping the sides of the throne, fighting conviction, said these words that you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. I meet a lot of people that went through life almost. We got people, family, friends, almost. Paul decided to overcome. When you read Acts chapter 2, I'm talking to my pastor this morning. I said, Pastor, what you preaching? This is a standard statement for me and him. I ask him what he's preaching. He's going to tell me, and then he'll say, and you? And I'll tell him. Well, he said, I'm preaching on Paul going to Rome. I said, well, how about that? Because I'm preaching on Paul preparing to go to Rome. I said, I backed up in the book of Acts and started reading chapter 23, 24, 25, 26 to figure out how Paul got where he was. He said, well, what a coincidence. So did I. And we got to comparing notes with one another, realizing what a crazy thing that Paul went through. He gets arrested, and as he gets arrested, there were these fanatics. Now, listen, guys, a fanatic is a fan that's gone crazy. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm a little bit fanatic about a, just one football team. That's it. And I, I'm not as fanatic as I have been, but who knows what's going to happen as you go. But a fanatic can be just a little bit on the edge. These guys, 40 of them, decided to fast and pray till Paul was executed. How would you like to have somebody that is so religious that they fasting and praying that you get executed? And then Paul stands before the government and says to them, hey, before y'all kill me, know this, I'm a Roman citizen. Well, when he threw the Roman citizen gauntlet down, that's like saying you're an American citizen. Can I get an amen? amen. You're an American citizen. You just ain't anyone. You're an American citizen. Hallelujah. So he threw the gauntlet down and said, I'm a Roman citizen. And when he said that, all of a sudden, the, the, the governor rose up and he put over 200 and something Roman guards to protect him, to look after Paul. To look at, it, it, this is amazing. So you go through these 40 fasts and then he's rescued by the governor Festus. God told him to testify in Jerusalem, then to Rome. Two years. Everybody say Two years. Over two years later, Paul still got passion. He still got desire. He wants to go to Rome. Two years later, now, the, the, the governor Festus has died or, or has been uh, removed and a guy named Felix. Don't you love all these names? So you've gone from Festus to Felix. Now, Felix is there, and Felix brings Paul in to bring him before Agrippa. Acts 26, verse 12. On one, on one of those journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priest. Now, Paul's testifying. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads or against the points in life. When I asked, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Now get up and stand up you're on your feet. I've appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have sent me of me, seen of me, and what I will show you. Paul, I will rescue you from your own people, from the Gentiles. I'm sending you to them. 
You have no idea how powerful a word is in your life. When 40 fasting fanatics are praying for your death, he has a word from God saying, I'm going to rescue you from your friends, from those around you, from your own people. I'll rescue you from those that are against you. To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so they may also receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. In other words, God was saying, look, I know they're fasting, but they in the wrong. They're doing it toward the wrong God. They, they, they don't understand who I am, but I promise you in my heart, I want everybody to be saved. And then King Agrippa so then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from, from heaven. Now listen, this is the second time Paul has shared the same testimony in four chapters. He's saying it again. In other words, you got to keep sharing your testimony. you got to remind yourself what God did in your life. You can't just give up and say, well, you know, it happened there, but it can't happen again. It can happen again. God can keep blessing you and pressing you forward, amen, that you can be an overcomer. Can I get an amen? So he said, first to those in Damascus and then to those in Jerusalem, and all Judea and the Gentiles, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. I love that scripture. Repent and then prove to everybody that you've repented by the good deeds that you do. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple. They tried to kill me. But I've had God's help in every day. And so I stand here two years later. I'm just adding that. And testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses would have said. And that Jesus would suffer. And as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to all, to all people and the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. Said, you are crazy. Anybody ever called y'all that? You out of your mind, Paul. Amen. Your, your, your great learning has drove you insane. Paul said, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. I appreciate the fact that he kept this in a proper authority. He didn't just put him down, but he just said, okay, I'm not excellent. He kept it running here. Paul replied, what I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things. I can freely speak to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. Amen. God did this out in the light. King Agrippa, do you believe that the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you? Said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul replied, listen to this. Short time or long? I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. Amen. That everybody get free in Christ. That everybody knows that Jesus. I mean the fact that Jesus would knock that man down. His name was Saul. Sends him over to Ananias. Ananias lays hands on him. His eyes open up. And he realized, I never met this. You never met Jesus either. You never met Jesus. But yet you believe. Crazy, crazy people. Y'all crazy. Never met him and yet you believe. And not only that, you believe he resurrected from the dead. Hold on. And that he's coming back again? Crazy people. I love crazy people. Because I are one. They left the room, and while talking with one another, they said, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Amen. They just got a, they got a thought against him, the religious people do. But he ain't done anything wrong. I love the, and the King James said, almost thou persuade me to be a, almost. Everybody say Almost. Almost, almost, amen. Agrippa almost entered into salvation. He almost defied the sins of his father, amen, the death of James, imprisonment of Peter, and gave his heart to God. But in my mind, I can see him briefly looking back and realizing, and this is the problem. Some people, they almost is because what they think they're going to give up. What am I going to give up? First, he'd give up his position. As a king, he would give up his family. Did you know that there are family that will turn against you when you give your life to Jesus? Amen. They don't understand your Christ. They don't understand being born again. They don't understand your passion for the church. They don't understand all this thing about praying and fasting and giving. They don't understand about witnessing and sharing what Jesus does. They don't understand all that. So his family, his friends. When I got born again, my friends walked from me. 
or did I walk from them? It doesn't matter. There was a great gap between us. But as I began to serve God and keep serving God, let me tell you, Randy stayed with Jesus. Bubba stayed with Jesus. David got born again. Ended up in my graduation at the Bible college I graduated from. These are guys that I got drunk, stupid, and ignorant with. Amen. I watched God turn Mike. I mean, God turned Mike's, Mike's life around. He became a Christian. But boy, he was the guy who was more of a drunk than I was when we were young. And I watched God turn their lives around. Amen. Sometimes it looks like you're giving up everything, but you're not. God will trade in your old playmates, playground, and playthings for a new playmate, playground, and playthings. Amen. Amen. How about his wealth, possibly? Would you let go of this in order to get that? Almost thou persuadest me. And decided it's not worth it to me to have to give up all of this to inherit salvation. I think of what little I gave up. Amen. And so he boarded his ship. To sell back into a life of comfort and ease. If there's one problem that we Americans have is we love too much comfort and ease. We love our comfort. We love our ease in life. Almost I inherited the greatest gift known to man. Almost I entered into a, a peace that I've never known. Almost I was saved. Almost I entered the kingdom. Looking back, I found an opportunity to go back to what was familiar. I've often said that a man without a future always goes back to his past. Goes back to where he came from. Agrippa was so close. Almost. You persuaded me. I know what it looks like today. It looks like things are falling apart. Shaking at the seams. On the edge of a breakthrough. Bucking and rolling. Feel like we're about to explode. I'm a biker. I love riding scooters. And I can tell you this. There are times on my scooter, Brian, I've been at what is called a high-speed wobble. That bike will start shaking at a high speed. And I know what you're saying. Well, Pastor, you shouldn't have been going that fast. <laughs> Say what you want. When that thing starts shaking like that, i got a choice to make. I can pray that if I back off and hit a brake, John, it'll quit. Or I can press through just a little bit faster and it'll smooth out. But believe me, the fear is real. I'm not one that fears a lot of stuff. But that high speed moment, I had it on a bicycle going down a hill on top of Wheeler Mountain. No brakes on my sister's bike. You ain't never been that foolish. We push my sister's bike up in the woods, take off on it, no brakes. All of a sudden, that front wheel starts shaking. But if you go a little bit faster, it smooths out. The problem is, when you start backing back down again, Sammy, sometimes it picks back up again. Anyway, I know what it looks like. I'm just saying, keep the controls pushed all the way down. Break through. Decide to overcome 2020. Stand with me if you would. I believe when I hear those stats that one in five churches are closed in 18 months, my heart breaks because I know pastors that have poured their lives in years and years and tears into church life. I know saints who have who've given and blessed and worked and believed God. And, and all of a sudden now we're hearing because of this, this pandemic and the economy and, and businesses that have worked hard to stay open are struggling right now. And I say to myself, dear God, help us. Help us. Help us help one another to stay on our feet. It ain't about me. I have a few years left on this planet, and then I'm gone. But my children and my grandchildren, and the ones coming out, what kind of life are they going to have? So my passion is real. God, help us to overcome. Help us to break through. Amen. I want to see, I want to see people blessed in the house of God. Amen. I just want to see it happen. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. Sometimes just a little bit of joy is worth all them hours of crying. Amen. To know that the sun's coming up. Things are better. So in between the victories, there are going to be struggles. Between the breakthroughs of the battles, in between the joy comes the weeping. you got to determine, I'm going to overcome. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. God, hear my heart. I've been pessimistic about this year. I've been broken for the hearts of the people who have 
wanted to give up. Depressed. Suicidal. I wanted to throw the towel in. But God, if there's a way I could catch that towel in midair and throw it back to him and say, don't you do it. Don't you give in. You're right on the crespice. You're right on the edge. Endure through this moment. Press in. You're sold, man. You're sold. You've been sowing into this thing. You've been, you've been feeding into this thing with your energy and your time and your finances. Don't you quit now. There's a crown on the other side for those who endure. For those that press through. That make it to the end. So I speak to this house and those watching, God, in the name of Jesus, that life is going to turn around. It's just right on the edge. I believe it in my whole heart. So I'm telling you, decide. Make that decision. Don't be an almost. Don't be an almost. Almost you persuade me. Almost you persuaded me for eternal life. Almost you persuaded me to move toward the end. Almost. No, don't be an almost. Be already. Be already in, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I speak joy into your life right now. Peace, long-suffering, in Jesus' name. Come on, give God a praise in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, you know what I'm waiting on, Clanton? You know what I'm waiting on? I'm waiting to see a football team run out on the field, and on the back of that jersey, it said, love, joy, yeah. Peace, right. long suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness. I want to see people instead of trying to say and force folk to socially uh, become social, right. to look toward the Word of God and realize the only real change in your life comes through the gospel. That if you can take the gospel, things will change. <laughs> Love your neighbor. Just put love your neighbor on the back of every one of them NBA boys' shirts. Amen. Love your neighbor. That's all you got to say. You ain't got to put somebody's name on the back who's a criminal and got shot. Put on the back of your shirt something that's got some life to it. Love your neighbor. Woo. I tell you things would change. But I only got this much influence. I need the governor's ear. I need the Presidente's ear. Right. Amen. I'm going to get a I'll quit, Jerry. Behave. Hallelujah. Can sit down just for a moment. Grab a tithe and offer an envelope. Everybody in the house. If not, grab your phone. Get ready to learn how to give online. Amen. Everybody be a giver in the house. Support the ministries of this house. Amen. And honor God. Your giving is all about honoring the king. I'd never show forth before a king without honoring him. That's what is important to our guests that are here. Thanks for coming. David's got a few announcements as I prepare to depart. Don't forget in the back of this building, amen, in the fellowship hall is our uh, Muscle Car Sunday shirts. Done so well. Such good looking shirts, amen. Stay in your lane. Uh, again, free barbecue. There's some handouts in the back. Go to the local bar. I don't care where you go, but let me just say this for you to understand, particularly if you're new, Muscle Car Sunday is not a family day to get together to eat, but it is. Muscle Car Sunday is not just a day to get together and have church outdoors, but it is. Muscle Car Sunday is about reaching people that the church can't reach on normal Sunday mornings. Because you're inviting people to a car show and a bike show who have motorcycles and hot rods, who normally would never darken the doors of a church. Guys like me when I was young. This is how you get them there. With some little bit different music, a whole lot of kindness and being friendly. And you can stay home if you want. Sure, you can take the Sunday off. I'm just going to take the Sunday off. Or you can say to yourself, does it really matter if the wall fell on them 18 people and they died of whatever that they knew Jesus. That's what Jesus was saying. So in my heart, I have a passion for this day. We created over 20 years ago. It's won more people to Christ. It's got more people involved in our church. The only thing that's even compared to it is funerals. We want more people at funerals than, than second to Muscle Car Sunday. It's crazy. So folk don't just always come to church on Sunday. But on this day, a lot of people will show up that don't go. 
If you'll keep that in mind, that this is an outreach, that these are hooks. Uh, Cheryl, you went to a car show you and Dennis did on Saturday night. I went on Friday night. It's amazing to me. I pull up in a purple car how people gather around that car and look at it. Their memories flood back to the 70s. All of a sudden, they can hear Boston in their mind. They hear Nazareth. Love hurts. They hear music in their mind. Amen. And they think about their life as it once was before the grace set in. Amen. It's amazing. And I get to walk up and talk to them. And I look at them and say, look at the box in the back of this car. You see that little box? That's the ashes of the friend of mine who once owned this car, who had one cry when he died that he would be able to ride in this car. And so we had him cremated. He's still in the car. He's been through two floods, and he's still in the car. Still there. Amen. And I use him to witness as a hook that Rodney knew Jesus before he died. But before he died, he was an alcoholic who struggled with this thing, man, and fought with it. But he loved this house. He loved me. He loved God. So you can't let their testimony go without. Amen? So I'm passionate about this day. Passionate about it. It takes a lot of hard work. Well, I've been there before. but I know you have. will not you come back again? Amen? Pick up a shirt in the back. Be a witness. Hallelujah. Get ready to give. Today we have swap seniors with a purpose. See the riches in the bag. Anything you guys want to tell them today? Come on. Come and fellowship. Hang out. Drink some coffee. Read some word. Not too much better than that. Now uh, now till uh, Muscle Car, there's going to be barbecue donations in the back. Um, it says, please donate uh, money into the crock pots in the back of the church. Or if you just put it on your tithing off on, uh, offering envelope, just put a uh, crock pot or barbecue. They'll understand what it is. Uh, every Tuesday night, two or more prayer meeting. Uh, that's at 7 p.m. Uh, except for the first Tuesday, which is going to be obviously our first week, midweek. September 19th is going to be acoustic night, a live concert Saturday night in the Tabernacle at the New Caney campus, 7 p.m. Pay $10 online through uh, Eventbrite for tickets. Uh, it's going to be Matt Bird and uh, Zana. Uh, contact Jason Drotty for details. He, he's the guy who was up here playing the uh, bass earlier. Or, uh, no, he was playing guitar. Yeah. yeah. Um, September 20th, Lift Ladies Bible Study after service in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, see Miss Diane Phelan. Is she here? Oh, there she is. I was like, I know I know, I saw her. Uh, you have anything you want to say about that? Okay. Amen. Yeah, uh, definitely come hang out. Hang out with Miss Val. September 27th, uh, TLCC Kitchen Crew needs cookies and brownies uh, in a single serving baggies. Again, the single serving is just for, for the, the safety measures to allow people to understand that we are taking the extra measure. We might be meeting together in a large crowd, but the, we still got to take every precaution that we can take that makes people feel safe, especially if they've not been in our church. We want to make them feel as comfortable as possible. Amen. Um, again, September 27th is Muscle Car Sunday. Uh, the message is going to be on stay in your lane. Um, and guys, we just need help. That's the reality. This thing does not happen without you guys. The staff, we work as hard as we can to make sure we get everything in line. But there's just a lot of extras that have to go into preparing for it. I think this year we're preparing for 700 uh, and may end up being more. And, and the reality is four or five people can't really do everything it takes to get ready for that many people. So we need your help. Uh, anybody that's involved in, in the ministries around here, we need your help just to uh, get your stuff ready so that if people have questions about your ministry, again, if it's about bait, if it's about hooks, your ministry may be what it takes for these people to get plugged in. So have stuff ready for them. Have them uh, just come, be a part. That's what we need. October 4th through the 7th is going to be our fall conference. It's going to be 2020. Again, it's overcoming 2020. The pastor's leading up to it. That's what today's message was all about. It's just preparing 
to overcome 2020. And the truth is, is we're getting toward the end of 2020, but we still have to overcome everything that's been seen, everything. And we know that the only way is through Christ. We know the only way to be able to overcome any of our obstacles in life is through hands to the plow and just saying, okay, Jesus, I need you to put your super on my natural and let's get through this crazy, crazy year. Amen. Today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates in return, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Thank you guys. We love you. Lord, I just pray that you would bless every single person in here. The gift and the giver in this house would be exponential, Lord. It would be like the the bread and the fishes, Lord, it would be multiplied in this house so that we can continue to reach our communities. We love you, Lord. Bless every person in here and bless everybody online. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.